Welcome, everybody, to the Grilling Truth Network's weekly show, the Colts Weekly. Um, I'm your co-host, Steve Risley, along with our resident, Bert, and co-host, Colin. Or Colin Hang on. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Grilling Truth's weekly show on the Colts, the Colts Weekly Show. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at the uh, Colts' uh, grinded out victory over the Tennessee Titans on the road. Uh, and we also will preview the game against the Atlanta Falcons coming up. We made a good showing on uh, this weekend's games, and uh, we'll have a few other things to talk about. But first, I want to welcome in our resident expert on the Colts and my co-host for the show, Cole Hanna. Cole, how are you doing today, buddy? How's college life? Yeah, yeah, doing pretty good. I can't complain about the college life right now. So <laughs> it's always a good time down here, so nothing to complain about. There you go. Um, okay, let's start off talking about the defense. Let's go there first. Yep. What are your yeah, thoughts? You know, I, I thought the defense was great all game long. And Tennessee's puts up 17 points in the game. But you got to put that in context. A, a field goal of that came off a Jacoby Brissett turnover. Can't really fault that on the defense. And then the second score for the Titans came on a short field where the offense kind of put the defense in a bad position. Uh, and had them with a short field. I believe the Tennessee drive started like the Colts' 40-yard line. Um, so, so they were very, very good all game long. I thought much, much better performance defensively than what they put up week one against the Chargers. Now, Marcus Mariota is not the most dynamic quarterback. We know that. He's been very, very inconsistent throughout his career, and you know, only 154 yards passing for Mariota in this game. Uh, Derrick Henry did have a good game, 15 carries for 81 yards. And the rushing stats looked good for Tennessee when you look back at the game, but I thought the Colts did a much better job of limiting their production as far as running the ball. They didn't let, you know, get dominated like they did uh, in key moments uh, like they did week one against the Chargers. Much, much better performance for the Colts defensively. Uh, you know, they made the plays they needed to make. You, to nitpick a little bit, you would like to see them, you know, get on a few of those turnover opportunities. They had multiple fumbles in this game, and the Colts just couldn't really jump on one. Uh, looking back, that could have made what was a good defensive performance for the Colts uh, turn into a great defensive performance for the team. But definitely much, much better than what they put up week one. Yeah, I thought what was interesting was, uh, looking at the, the breakdown of scoring, the Colts held them to zero points in the first quarter, which just kind of gets you off to a quick start if you score. So yeah. they didn't get any points in the first quarter. They scored seven in the second, ten in the third, and they got nothing in the fourth. So I, I think what, what's great about the Colts defense, and we'll, we'll break it down by groups, was they held the, they held themselves when they needed to. You didn't let anybody get off to a fast start, and when the game got on the line, they couldn't punch it in and get a score. Yeah. Um, so you know we scored in three of the four quarters. We did not score in the third quarter, but we scored consistently in all three of them. So our offense seemed to be a lot more consistent than theirs. Uh, Mariota, you know, was 19 of 28 for 154 yards. Um, not much. I, the thing you talk about the rushing, you know, Henry only his longest run was 18 yards. And, you know, Mariota had the next longest run, which is probably a scramble at 15 yards. Other than that, we didn't give up any big running big plays. Um, yeah. So I think that, that bodes well to um, our, our, defensive, uh, our defensive front. I know we talked a little bit about that last week. Uh, I thought it was a weak spot, but I thought they stepped up and played a lot better this week in plugging holes and not giving up any big plays. Uh, I think Mariota was sacked four times. We were able to get yeah, to him four, four times. times. And, and, and you yeah. need to give we need to give some credit to Denico Autry on the front line. We were talking about those D tackles week one. How was a bad game for them? Uh, Autry was an absolute wrecking ball for the Colts up front. He had two of those four sacks. Tennessee could not block him all game long. He was really a nightmare. Um, and then as you mentioned, the four sacks is obviously a good number. They had good pressure in Marietta all game long. That was without Kamoko Ture who might be their best pure pass rusher for the Colts on this team. He missed this week. Hopefully he's good to go next week against Atlanta. But minus him, the Colts were still able to get a lot of pressure on Mariota, which was encouraging to see. Yeah, but and again, I look, I look at the receiving yardages for Tennessee. And again, the, the longest pass they had was a 25-yard completion. Um, yeah. I mean, for any one play. So we're not giving up. What's good about our defense is, Every corp you know, slot, you know, the, the, the line, the linebackers in, in the, the, the secondary is holding their ground and doing their job and just not giving up big plays. And I think that's how we won this game. Yeah, no, no question about it. The defense played really well. You know, they didn't make any plays that are going to cost you the game. 
Um, you know, they, they did what they needed to do to win this game. They maybe didn't have to flashy plays or flashy turnovers, but they were just consistent across the entire game. They limited Tennessee throughout the game. It was a very, very encouraging performance by the team. Um, you know, obviously playing week one against a team like the Chargers, who I know they didn't look great week two, falling to Detroit, but that's been a very, very good offensive team uh, for a long time now. Phillip Rivers has been one of the premier quarterbacks in the NFL for a long time now. And the Colts really bounced back defensively. Just 240 total yards they gave up in this game. It was a very, very, very good performance for the Colts. Um, so, yeah, you, there, there's not a whole lot to complain. And, and the big number we have to bring up here, we're going to talk about the Colts defensively, and this is an absolutely outstanding you know, facet of their game. Tennessee finished the game 1 of 10 on third down conversions. I mean, that is yeah. great. When the Colts got them into third down and they needed to get off the field, they got off the field. I mean, absolutely fantastic from that standpoint. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think that's important. And again, we talk about the Chargers game. Had our kicker been functioning on all channels, and bless his heart, I mean, I'm an Adam Vinatieri fan, <laughs> yeah. but we'd have won that game. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically we'd have won that game. And we'll get to Vinatieri here a little bit later on in the show, um, but uh, we we could be sitting at two and zero very easily right now if, if Adam's leg had been working functionally right. Uh, in the first week. But then again, he almost gave this game away to us too um, yeah. for us. But we'll talk about him. But, no, I think the defense, I mean, you think this is a fluke or you think we just have a very solid 11-man defensive front or defensive team? No, yeah, I think the defense is very, very good. Uh, you, you know, you got to look, in, and it's not just this year. you got to go back to last season, really how that defense finished the year. I believe over the last 10 or 11 games, statistically, the Colts were the best defense in the NFL you know, really when they got to that midseason point, they really hit their stride and started playing well. You know, they went out and had a couple of big additions defensively to help them out. Um, you know, Rockison, they drafted him in the second round, who's now, you know, getting a lot of reps for them, looking good. Justin Houston bringing him over from Kansas City to give him another pure pass rusher, you know, helps you out defensively a lot. It's expected to be a very good defense. And, you know, what they did against Tennessee is what you want to see them continue to do moving forward. Again, ten, you know, let's be honest here. Tennessee is not the most explosive offense the Colts will face. But, you know, Tennessee lit up Cleveland week one, and the Colts did a much, much better job defensively of limiting Tennessee, uh, not giving up the explosive plays that we saw Cleveland give up in week one. And as we mentioned, getting a lot of pressure in Marriott, getting off the field in third downs. This is what you want to see from the Colts' defense. They really, really dominated this game, to be quite honest, from start to finish, uh, and played more, you know, more than just solid. It was a very, very good defensive performance for the Colts. I'd like to see them continue to do that moving forward. They, they did pick up a couple of injuries, which we're going to have to watch moving forward, see how that impacts them. Uh, but a very, very good performance overall. Yeah, and, and I, th- I think with Mariota, if he wasn't being sacked, uh, he was harassed almost every time he went back. I mean, there was yeah. somebody pushing him out of the pocket and making him throw on the run, which, you know, that's helter-skelter. Um, yeah. And th- then you're improvising on the run, and he- he's good at that. But it's, in- it's-, it's always inconsistent for any quarterback that does that, unless you're Aaron Rodgers. You know, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is probably the best in the league at creating plays on the run and, yeah. and finding people – um, and getting people open. Although the Carson Wentz play, did you see the Carson Wentz play where he threw the ball just before he got on his knees? Yeah, that was insane. <laughs> Don't that know how insane, he did yeah. that, but it was. <laughs> That's improvisation wow. right there. Yeah. But uh, defensively, I, I'm really pleased with the Colts are doing. I mean, there's a lot of guys making tackles. Um, you know, and let's talk about the injuries. I mean, the first, the, obviously, the big run right now is Darius Leonard is now in concussion protocol. This yep. week, it's not likely that he's going to be available. I, I rarely do you see somebody come out of a concussion protocol in one week. Um, how much is that going to hurt us? I mean, a lot, I'm guessing, but what's your thought? Yeah. Now, I, I do think the Colts have better depth at the linebacker position this year. Uh, a guy I'm looking at is Bobby Okariki. They drafted him a rookie out of Stanford. He played a little bit against Tennessee is a very good coverage linebacker. He's similar to Leonard and, and he's got good size, but he's a very athletic guy, can move very well. That would probably be the guy they'd slot in for Darius Leonard if he does miss time. But obviously, I mean that's gonna be a big loss. Now I, I know Leonard struggled week one against the Chargers, had a better game this week, but he's just an absolute when he's on, I mean he's a wrecking ball. He can completely disrupt you know the the uh opposing team's offensive game plan. 
Uh, obviously, anytime you lose a guy like that, it's going to be a big loss. I do think, though, the Colts have more depth this year. They're, they're better versed to handle some controversy there as far as guys going down and, and still having impact players to step in. But we haven't really seen, you know, what's the drop-off of what it is, you know, if he does miss time. You know, he's pretty much been healthy uh, throughout his entire NFL career. So it'll be very, very interesting to see about how his, you know, if we do – have to go into the Atlanta game without Darius Leonard. How big of a drop off will it be? Uh, Anthony Walker, I thought, has played a very, very good year, or at least first couple games. You know, next to Leonard, a linebacker, that's someone you're going to have to, you know, step up. And if Leonard does miss time and, and you know, continue to grow as a player, uh, he's another young guy at linebacker. But he's definitely, I think, made strides so far this year. He's going to have to pick up a little bit of his slack there. But, you know, anytime you're relying on a rookie, uh, you know, there's some risk involved there with Okariki. So that's the guy that's probably going to step in if Leonard misses time. And obviously, anytime you miss a player like Leonard, you're going to feel it a little bit. But it's just about kind of minimizing that impact uh, for what the Colts want to do defensively. And I think the improved depth they have this year should allow them to do that. Well, from what I saw, it to me, it, just looked, it looks like it's an 11-man defense. We're not, I, I, I yeah. think losing, you know, Leonard's your leading tackler. He led the team in tackles with 10 total tackles. Six solo tackles. He had a sack. Um, you know, Autry had two sacks. So, uh, you know, but losing a player like Leonard is never a good thing. Um, and hopefully, within the next week after this against Oakland, he'll be back. But I, I, and he may come back. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know how serious it is, or if he can clear protocol or not. But generally, they don't let you clear it in one week. Yeah, um, it's obviously. I think, like you said, it's going to depend on how bad it is because concussions. Yeah, is- we don't know. It can vary so much. You know, from what I – I mean, he finished the game, I believe, which is an interesting thing. According yeah, he to Wright, played the whole game, yeah. Yeah, he developed those symptoms, you know, after the game ended. So is it a minor thing or, you know, we don't know. The fact he, he finished the game would lead you to believe it's not a major concussion, but you just never know with those. So that will be something very interesting to monitor going forward. Well, let me tell you something. I get concussed every time my wife tells me I have to take the trash out. <laughs> So I say I'm in concussion protocol. I, I can't, I'm not allowed to do any heavy lifting or any work. <laughs> yeah. So and the trash has to go out tonight. So guess what? When Ross gets home from his movie set, he'll be taking the trash out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't go. want to deal with it. Any other there thoughts on defense before we shift over to the other? I, I I like our defense. I mean, I, I you know we held them on rushing yards. We held them on on passing yards. And, and yeah, Tennessee may not be the most explosive offensive team, but. You know, they look strong against Cleveland. But then, after watching Cleveland play last night, I think they're a little overrated football team. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I think Mayfield's I think struggling so. right now. Um, you know, he's got two great receivers in Landry and, and Beckham, and he's not delivering the ball right now. So, I don't know if that's a case of Cleveland being bad or Tennessee being good. So, But the interesting thing about that division now is we got, what, three teams at 1-1 and and one team at 0-2, don't we? Yep. Jacksonville's yep. zone too, I believe. So it's wide yep. open now. And yep. basically, no doubt about we, we could e- if, if Adam had had a good game, we could easily be sitting on top of that at 2 and 0 already. I mean, easily. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have played be. the Chargers, but, um, you know, we just didn't get the points on the board. Yeah. So. No doubt about it. Probably should be. The only thing I would add defensively, again, like, like we mentioned, it's a very, very good performance. Um, another thing that we should probably touch on is the injury to Pierre Desir at corner. Mm-hmm. Um, again, this doesn't sound like a major thing. It seems he's dealing with a bone bruise. He's suffering the game. Um, left around halftime of that game. So he's if he's going to miss time, they're going to turn to Quincy Wilson at corner, who just want to give him a quick shout-out because, you know, when they needed him to make a play, Tennessee in that last drive of fourth and two, they threw at Quincy Wilson at corner who, you know, plays some really, really good defense and has, you know, ends up with a pass defense and, you know, pretty much ends the game on that play. So I think that's another example I've mentioned a couple times, the improved depth of the Colts. If Desir goes down, they like Quincy Wilson at corner. You know, he played extensively for them last year. They can slot him in and hopefully not miss a beat. So definitely, definitely pleased with what the Colts defense is able to give us against Tennessee. And even though they, you know, might be without a couple key players defensively, I think they have the depth to, to handle and play well. But the, the Falcons are a pretty explosive offense, so they're going to have their hands full next week. Yeah, we saw that Sunday night. Uh, you yeah. Know, I, yeah, we saw them. I mean, I, I, I thought Philly had them, and, but every time they did, Atlanta came right back and, um, you know, put, put, the, 
put the heat on them right away again. And they marched yeah. down the field and scored. So, you know, they've got a great quarterback, um, and they've got great coaching, and it's going to be a very difficult game. Although we are playing at home for the first time. we got two home games coming up. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I agree. But I, I like the fact that we have a very young secondary. So I think every game they're going to get better. I mean, they're, yeah. they're going to get in the flow and learn the moves of the, of the players, learn how quick the game is played at, at this level, and they're going to do a lot better and continue to grow. You know, they're young. You can mold them. we got a good coach that's going to mold them. So I think we're going to be fine defensively just so we don't get somebody bust us big. But, you know, we held them. We only got 123 yards total rushing. Um, and 119 or 154 passing. So I guess the 119s when they take away the sacks. I guess they do the yeah. team totals. Yeah, they they rip the sacks away from. You. So if you take total passing yards 119, they actually threw for 154 with one one TD, um, but four sacks, which I thought was really good. All right, let's run over to the offense. Let's let's start with Vinatieri. Let's just start there. Again, I mean, yeah. <laughs> One for three on extra points. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is a guy he, who's a hero to all of us. Because he's been here so long. Um, but I mean, is it just is this just a going through a bad streak, or do we think at forty six he's just had enough? Yeah, well, the Colts are definitely banking on this being a bad streak because Frank Reich is pretty adamant that he he thinks Vinatieri can work it out, and you know improve going forward because well at least hopefully he can improve going forward because it's tough to be worse than what he is right now i mean like you said one of three on extra points is just i mean that's atrocious for an nfl kicker to be struggling on on extra points and what scares me steve when you look at this vanitary situation is it's one thing if he starts out this season with a couple bad games you're like okay he's just had a you know he's going through a bad streak he'll get through it but hit, these struggles do extend into the late part of last season. You know, he, he was struggling yeah, to end the year last year. Then, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so, you know, at some point, this is not going to be a fluke. This is not going to be, oh, he's going through a, a, just a bad stretch. This is just going to be, you know, what he's done for you for, you know, multiple weeks in a row. So I, I saw the Colts wor- working out some kickers. They're obviously not going to make a move there. They seem pretty adamant that, you know, Vinatieri's their kicker. He'll work through this. But there's got to be a, a high level of concern, I would think, around the organization. Because I know I'm very concerned watching Vinatieri kick. I mean, some of these kicks are not even close. I know the one hit hit the crossbar, but the one before that was, I think, he missed that on an extra point probably by 20 yards to the left. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they're, they're just not even close right now. And anytime you're dealing with a kicker who's 46 years old, you know, the natural question that's going to come to your mind is, okay, is he washed up? Is he done? I mean, you know, Father Time is undefeated, right? It catches up with everyone at some point. Is it that right. time for Vinatieri? It definitely looks like it is right now. You know, Frank Reich is obviously, you know, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He's been a great coach since he's gotten here. He sees Vinatieri every day in practice. He knows the kind of kicker he is, you know, better than anyone. But at some point, you know, he, he I think you can make a very real argument he cost them the game in week one. I think you can make a very real argument he – came dangerously close to doing that again in week two. And if yeah. they stay with Vinatieri moving forward and he continues to cost them games, you know, that's that's a big risk that you know, Frank Reich's taking to stick with him. But, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt if he thinks Vinatieri can, you know, exercise these demons he has going on right now, then, you know, I'll, you know, I'll trust him because I think Frank Reich has deserved the benefit of the doubt. But definitely, at least for me, there's a high, high level of concern right now with what Vinatieri is doing. I agree entirely. This is a football team that I think is a playoff caliber football team. I think the Colts are definitely a playoff caliber football team. And we don't need to get in a, in a one and five hole again like we did last year and then dig our way out of it and make the playoffs. Um, this yeah. is a team that can win the division, basically. I believe so. Um, and what, what you don't want is, is to, you know, this is a team that could, be, could easily be 2-0 and and could easily be 0-2. But the yeah. 0-2 would fall on Vinatieri's legs, basically. I mean, they didn't even attempt a field goal in this game. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that was lack of confidence or what. I mean, what was our conversion rate on thirds downs? Uh, let, let me pull it. I believe it, it, it was pretty efficient, 7 of 14. Um, so, okay. you know, they, yeah, they're 50% on third downs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's almost like now you're seeing, 
he's relegated himself to Terry right now is, is just an extra point kicker. You know, he can't even do that effectively right now. <laughs> he can't even do that effectively. He's one for three. He was what was he one for one for two last game? Yeah, I believe. Well, yeah, yeah, because I, I think he just missed one extra point last week, but then he missed another field goal that was pretty much an extra point range. So he's two for so, five on extra points. I mean, this is yeah. this is a kick for him that used to be just automatic. I, I, I believe he's three. Of, I believe he's three of seven dating back to last season. Actually, if you count those last yeah, throwing the, throw the, the last yeah. playoff game yeah against Kansas City yeah. So three of seven. I mean, that's that's very concerning. Um, when you know, you, 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 because we were in a situation at 19 to 17, if they got into field goal range, they, they can't. They, they kick it, they win. They don't kick it, then tie, and give us another yeah. chance to get the ball back and score again. You know, they beat us, and we were lucky. Our defense held ground; it stood their ground. Um, okay, so we got everybody's going to watch that closely. I know it, it's. I know everybody loves Adam Vinatieri. I mean, he's a, he's a Fan favorite. I mean, he's been here forever, and, and but at some point you got to start putting wins and losses ahead of you know love affairs with players. So I think one more bad game, and I think there'll be some changes made at that yep. point like that. So you know, I'm I'm sure he's mentally. And I don't think there's anybody beating himself up more than Adam Vinatieri himself. You know, I, I no, just think he's that class of a, a person. So I don't. I think he's probably more upset and frustrated with the process of himself than anybody else does. So, but we'll see what happens on that. Let's start off with, before we get to passing, let's talk about our rushing game. We came in, again, we rushed for over, what, 250 yards as a team last year, most of it from Marlon Mack. When we come back this week, and last week, come back this week, we get 167 yes. yards. Uh, but Jordan Wilkins carries for us, too. He's five carries for 82 yards. Of course, he had a 55-yard run. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it, that takes the pressure of Mack. Mack has 20 carries for 51 yards. But I'm sure they're keying on him now when he come off a 140 or 150 yard, 174 yard running game. You know they're going to come after you. They're going to they're going to key on you. Um, yep. But overall, as as a rushing producing team, um, what's your thoughts on the Colts as, as a rushing offense right now? And, and so throw in the offensive line with that too, because I think the yeah. whole key to this is, is our front five. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Just the the offensive line is really been the anchor of this team through the first two weeks. They've done a good job of protecting Brissett, and they've really cleared a lot of holes. I mean, when you look at that, that obviously the big play of the game was that Jordan Wilkins 55-yard run that kind of set up that go-ahead touchdown for the Colts that ultimately won them the game. I mean, that was just a thing of beauty. When you look at the seals, the offensive line was getting there. I mean, you could have drove a truck through that hole. I mean, it, it was really a thing of beauty. Quentin Nelson – you know, one of the big things about offensive linemen that's always kind of been the stereotype is, you know, they kind of go unnoticed. You don't really notice offensive linemen. They're not flashy. Oh, you know, you notice Quentin Nelson. You notice Quentin Nelson. I mean, they, <laughs> every week, you know, there's guys doing breakdowns of the pancake blocks of him putting guys on their asses. I mean, it, it is absolutely exciting. It's exciting to watch. It really is. I mean, he is an absolute game changer of the offensive line. And when you got a guy like that up front, just run behind them. <laughs> what's the what's the defense going to do when you have a guy that's clearing holes like the way Nelson is right now? And they're all across the offensive line, they're all playing really well. And obviously, really excited that Jordan Wilkins had a good game. You know, they have the depth of running back where it's not just Marlon Mack, where they don't need to give him 20, 25 carries every week. I know Marlon Mack carried the ball 20 times this week, but when Wilkins has a game like that, I think moving forward you're going to start to give him some more carries lessen the workload of Marlon Mack because obviously you want him to be healthy moving forward with how dynamic he is as a running back. But really, the big thing to me, and it's not just a 55-yard run, I know Wilkins carries the ball five times, only five times, but when he went in there, I thought the running game did not take a hit. I, you know, they, it was the same thing, churning out at least, you know, four to five, six yards to carry with Wilkins in there, and he breaks the big one at the end. And, you know, I, I just think that's how the Colts are going to want to play moving forward. They have a dominant offensive line. They have a very good, stable running backs. So rely on those guys. You know, you let those guys carry you for the game. And I, I think ripping off that 55-yard run is not a coincidence that that comes at the end of the game. I mean, the Colts stood behind that running game all game long. You have a punishing offensive line, and you, you start to wear teams down as the game goes on. You know, defensive fronts are going to be tired, you know, whenever they play the Colts and how, you know, how they adhere to that running game throughout the game. 
Marlon Mack, they gave 20 carries at the game. Uh, Naheem Hines got a couple carries. You know, Brissett carried it seven times. So, you know, when you have a dominant offensive line like that and you have the running game going like that, you've got to just keep feeding them the ball. You've just got to rely on that, control the flow of the game. The Colts did a very good job of that. Um, we can get into the passing game later because I think, you know, what the Colts do running and what they do passing, those are going to be inherently linked together. Well, um, I think they're I linked exactly. Yeah, they're linked together. You know, yeah. And I looked at it here, and you know, we rushed the ball 34 times. Tennessee only rushed it 24 times. So when you can yeah. put 34 rushes up, that takes all the pressure off your quarterback. Um, exactly. Because you, play action becomes – correct me if I'm wrong or, or talk about this – Play action is the most effective way to open up under the, under the zone offensively um, or get you guys deep because the safety's got to play up a little bit. They've got to be reactionary to the play action. And if you're putting 34 rushes up and getting these kind of yardages every week, um, that opens up your offense incredibly. Is that correct or not? No, yeah, you're absolutely spot on. I, I, I think there's no question the the play action is going to be deadly for the Colts this year. I think they, we, I think especially with what they've put on tape the first couple of weeks, with how effectively they've run the ball. I mean, you've got to respect the Colts' running game because right now that's what their offense is. It's a run-heavy offense. They've had more rushing yards and passing yards, you know, through these first two weeks, and really it hasn't been that close. I mean, I, I know it's just ended up with about 25, 26 yards week two. Obviously, week one it was much more lopsided in terms of rushing yards outweighing the passing yards. But teams are going to have to start respecting that running game. You're going to have guys, you know, cheating up. And all you need to do is freeze those DBs, freeze those safeties for a second to get a guy free on those play action. And I don't think there's any question when you run the ball like the Colts run the ball, that's going to open up some things passing the football. Now, I know Frank Wright commented on it. You know, I think everyone knows at some point the Colts are going to have to open up the passing offense a little bit. You love what they're doing running the football but you would like to see a little bit more explosive plays come in the pass game, especially to complement that running game. Because when you start ripping off some explosive plays and play action and taking the top off the defense, that's just a nightmare to defend. Because now you don't know if you want to come up and play the run or if you need to be safe and you know watch for that play action. Because that, that's just a nightmare scenario for defenses to go through when you really don't know how to play this offense. And I think that's something the Colts are going to have to do moving forward. Uh, I, I know the players talked about you know, the running game throughout the week after you know what they did against Tennessee, just saying when you can run the football that effectively, you know that just opens yeah. up the offense so much. They're going to get some some favorable looks from defenses to take some shots down the field, 20, 25 yard gains down the field because their teams are going to come up. They're going to have to play that run game and play that run game hard. Um, and I think that's going to be the key to the Colts' offense. If they want to be a deadly offense, it's going to be can they take advantage of the dominant running game they have right now and start to rip off some explosive plays in the passing game. That's something I think well, is going to be very, very, very interesting moving forward. And I'll just say this about the Falcons. That was a team week one that got exposed as far as their rushing defense against the Vikings. So the Colts then can take advantage of that. And, and Atlanta's probably right. fully aware that, hey, we're going to have to stop this running attack so I'm very curious, do the Colts know, do they, you know, throw in some play actions, take advantage of that weak, you know, Atlanta run defense that they're going to have to, you know, play the run game really, really honest against the Colts to try to limit that, and do they get some explosive plays in the passing game? Can they start to get that passing game going a little bit? I think that's going to be the key for the Colts' offense moving forward. Well, yeah, I think there's three parts to this, too. I think, first off, we'll get explosive because we have T.Y. Hilton. Yeah. You know, and he's yeah, at that elite he's level. He's, he's not quite an Odell Beckham at that level yet, but he's close. I mean, he, he's an explosive player, and you're not going to be able to contain him very long because you're going to have to start respecting a running game, and you're going to get, have to you know play more man coverage on him on a running game because we've got to protect the line coming up the middle because we're, we're running the ball for good yards whenever we run it. Uh, but the, other, the second part is we have a great tight end core with Jack Doyle and uh, Eric Ebron. I mean, so we can do the, the dump short passes right over the middle, and the less string we can put on Brissett until he gets comfortable, you know, as the captain of this offense. I mean, he, he, he ran the team for a year, but he knew he was just there because luck was hurt. You know, yeah. now I, I think the mentality is, hey, this is your team. I mean, luck's gone. He's not coming back. So we're not, you're not just filling in for somebody. This is your football team. 
And I think they, they're ha- the Colts are having the luxury right now of bringing Brissett along very slowly, very methodically, letting him get comfortable, letting him learn to make reads, letting him learn to, you know, check off and find secondary receivers and do the things that he did. Um, but our receiving core, you, you know, Hilton catches four, B run three, um, Rogers three, Doyle two, um, you know, Paris Campbell got a catch, and he's a young prodigy that you know, they haven't even really utilized yet to much great, but, but you yeah. can. Um, and but, I, I think he can be. I think he can be a very deadly weapon for them moving forward this year. With you know, that's oh, I think he's an up and coming Ty Hilton. Yeah, I think yeah. he's an up and coming Ty Hilton. You know, that's how Ty started for us. Remember, he kind of just kind of filtered into the system, and he hooked up with um, with Andrew, and all of a sudden they started connecting big time. And uh, look what he look what Andrew turned him into. I mean, he, he's a yeah. prime star wide receiver in the NFL right now. So no, no, I no think question. it's great. Hilton is a, Hilton's an elite level receiver in this league. I don't think there's any yeah, question. Yeah, he's an elite. Yeah, yeah. And and then so okay so so I think a ah. running game is definitely creating a lot of opportunity for us on offense, and we got to keep that going. But I think that opportunity is being created because of the work of our offensive line. Ryan Kelly's staying healthy. The Stones is staying healthy. Um, uh, you know, Quentin Nelson's a beast. The left side of that line is almost unstoppable. I mean, you, you just get behind them and run, and they're going to open holes for you. And Costanzo's yeah. been great at protecting the backside at the left tackle. It's not an easy job to do. Um, so let's talk about Brissett. Again, 17 for 28, only 146 yards. Um, again, a quarterback rating of 95.2, which is not shabby. Uh, three touchdown passes. He finally threw a pick, and he fumbled once. But uh, was that on a sack? Did he fumble on a sack? No, it, it was like a – it was a kind of a fluke play where, you know, he, he was under pressure, just tried to pump fake it and kind of just the ball mm. flipped out of his hands pretty much when he tried to bring it back. And, you know, it's just one of those plays that just happens. But, you know, it, but it, it what's is your, What's your take on Brissett? I mean, I mean, is he is he overrated, underrated? Or, I mean, I know he's not falling into anybody's top ten category yet, but I don't think he, he's needed to. I just don't think there's been a need to with our running game and our offensive line. No, I, I, I definitely think – no, I, I think if you really wanted to nitpick him, you could say, you know, right now they've been very, very conservative as far as what they've done in the passing game. Been a lot of check downs, a lot of underneath stuff. Um, right now, you know, he – Maybe you can, you know, nitpick a little bit some of the reads he's making, maybe not taking some of those risks down the field when maybe there's an opportunity there. And I think that's definitely fair. You can nitpick him on that stuff. But I, I think he's he's played. It, it's tough to complain about a 5-1 to one touchdown to interception ratio, you know, through two weeks. I mean, he's on pace right now for more touchdown passes than what Andrew Luck threw last year. Now, obviously, yeah, you, don't have, you don't have the, the you know, big yardage and the impressive yardage and all that stuff right now through the first couple of weeks. But I think that's as much of a factor of just how dominant they've been running the football as it is anything else. Um, I, I think you put it perfectly. You know, he may not be putting up the, the glamorous stats right now, but it's because they don't need to. It's because the running game has been such a, a dominant weapon for them that there's no reason to go away from that. Now, I, I think moving forward, and like I said, they're, you know, 140 passing yards is not going to get the job done week in and week out. So that's going to have to get better, especially when they play. You know, when you look at that game against the Chiefs, right? They're going to, you mm-hmm. know, Mahomes is going to put up a lot of numbers. They're going to put up a lot of yeah. yards. Even the Falcons can be an offense. They're going to put up a lot of numbers. You know, you know, at least they're capable of doing so. We'll see how the defense plays, but they're capable of, you know, putting up a lot of points in those, on the board. So you're going to need a, – a, there's going to be some games where the Colts are going to need to throw the ball better than what they have right now, get a little bit more explosive in the passing game. And when the Colts prove they can do that, when they can, you know, take advantage of, of that run game and start to, you know, u- utilize the play action and, and play off that dominant running game and start beating teams through the air, that's going to make them a truly elite offense. I, you know, I don't like to compare teams to New England a lot just because they've kind of been an outlier in so many ways. But when you look at what New England is as an offense, I think what makes them so deadly is they can beat you 
in pretty much whatever way they need to. That's running the football. They've become a very good running team throughout the years. And, you know, when they play teams with weak run defense, they take advantage of that. When they need to throw the ball, they can throw the football down the field. They can take advantage of play action. That's not necessarily an offense that's built on on 45-yard, you know, Hail Marys down the field or taking advantage of all that stuff, but they just take advantage of the, you know, underneath coverage. You know, they hit those, you know, short to intermediate routes, get a lot of yards after the catch. And it's just been an offense that beats you in whatever way they need to beat you. Right now, the Colts have proven we can beat you on the ground. We have a running attack that can beat you on the ground. What they need to prove is when they need to, that they can beat you through the air with explosive plays through the air. You know, I, I, so I think when teams adjust to what the Colts are doing offensively, when they start to play that run game hard and try to limit what Marlon Mack does, what Jordan Wilkins does, that's going to be the true test for Brissett. Can he take advantage of that and start to hit some more explosive plays in the passing game? I think he can. I, I just think it's a function. They haven't asked him to do that right now. They've been pretty conservative offensively. But I, I definitely think moving forward, and as I mentioned earlier, the key is going to be taking advantage of the passing attack you know, it, with the, when you have a running game like the Colts do, it's just going to set up the passing attack at some point. Getting those explosive plays through the air is going to really put defenses in a tough spot, and that's what I'm looking for from Brissett moving forward. Yeah, and, and I would think that's going to come. I, I think, and I'm impressed with the coaching staff for just just keeping the pressure off of Brissett as he sinks into being, you know, the captain and leader of this football team, and not put the extra stress on him to where. He's having to win games and scramble and win them on his own. We're fortunate enough. So if you're Atlanta and you're coming into Luke Soil, um, are you focusing on – is your defense set up to stop the run or stop the pass right now? Yeah, no, I think right now if you're Atlanta, you got to stop the run game, right? I mean, look at – if you go to what Atlanta did week one against Minnesota, uh, Kirk Cousins threw 10 passes in that game. He was 8 of 10 for 98 yards and a touchdown. What Minnesota did in that game was ran the ball 38 times for 172 yards and three touchdowns on the ground. They exposed that Atlanta uh, running defense. D- Dalvin Cook had over 100 yards in that game. Their backup running back Madison had nine carries for 50 yards. It, it was truly a dominant running performance for Minnesota. And Atlanta is going to go into this game against the Colts, who have really been just as dominant running the football as Minnesota has been through these first couple weeks. So when you look at that, you're probably thinking, okay, we have to limit the the explosive running attack of Marlon Mack, Jordan Wilkins, try to slow down the dominant offensive line they have up front and play to run. I mean, that's what the Colts have on tape is a dominant running football team. So that's when you kind of look at Jacoby Brissett and say, okay, you're going to get some opportunities here with how defenses are going to play us, you know, with what we put on tape. You can try to get some shots down the field, take some explosive plays, and really put defenses in a tough spot. But definitely, I, again, I, I'm not saying Jacoby Brissett needs to put up 350 yards, put up these super flashy numbers. Just start you know, taking some shots down the field, take advantage of that dominant running attack. I think the play action is going to be a big thing moving forward because that play action is going to set up a lot of stuff with how they're running the football right now. So that's something I'm, I'm just very, very curious to see if we can start to take advantage of that, get some more explosive you know, plays in the passing game. And you, because Brissett has a big arm. That's one thing you can't say. No, he does have a big arm. Yeah, he has a a very, very big arm. He can make a lot of throws. And you know, I think you mentioned it earlier, and and I agree. I think their lack of, you know, you know, big numbers in the passing game is as much a function of just with how dominant they've been on the ground more than anything. They haven't needed to throw the football a ton. They haven't needed to go get these explosive plays in the passing game. But you'd just like to see them start to work that into the offense here a little bit and kind of prove that they can beat teams through the air here. Yeah, and the stat that I would throw out there is all three of our touchdowns came from reset passing. We threw three TD passes. So while yeah. a running game got us in the position, when it got down to crunch time, you know, Brissett was able to get the ball in the end zone with his arm. All right, and I, I think that's something and, worth and That's because they have to have such respect for our running game in the red zone. They have to respect yeah. our running game. and. And that means that that gives you a different coverage. It gives you a man coverage or something like that. And you get guys like Ty um, or Ebron, or for that matter, um, you know, even a Doyle. Doyle's got some of the best hands in the NFL, and yeah. that just frees those guys up on one on one. And if Brissett continues to deliver the ball, but all three of our touchdowns came from Brissett's arm, not from the running game. I yeah. mean, I think I- the running game set up those touchdowns. But it came off his arm. We didn't score a running touchdown in this game, although I think the running yeah. game put us in position to score every time. 
Yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And that's something for set we should probably mention here has been absolutely almost perfect in the red zone. I mean, when they've gotten in the red zone, he, he's really done a, done a great job of finding guys. Uh, T.Y. Hilton has really been a weapon for him. I mean, whenever yeah. Jacoby needs a play, T.Y. just gets open the end zone. Three receiving touchdowns so far, uh, you know, through the first two games for T.Y. He's been – an absolute, you know, just reliable weapon for Jacoby. Whenever Jacoby needs a guy to get open, goes to T.Y. T.Y.'s been getting open. But, yeah, in the red zone, Jacoby's been great. Uh, you know, that, that pass to Paris Campbell is beautiful over the top of the defense. So you can't fault him for what he's done in the red zone at all. You know, the running game's gotten them to where they needed to go. You know, obviously set up a lot of those touchdown passes. But when they've gotten inside that 20, Jacoby's done what he's needed to do and, and punched the ball in the end zone for the for the offense. So, yeah, I mean, can't can't fault him at all for what he's done in the red zone. I, I think the yards will come. I think the explosive plays will come. Um, you know, I, I have faith in Percet. I, I think, obviously, you can nitpick what he's done and say, you know, well, you could have taken advantage of this or that. But overall, he's got to be satisfied with what he's given you through the first two weeks. I mean, he, you can't fault him for what he's done. He, he's played, I think, well enough to win in both games. I don't know that I can even nitpick it really truthfully because I, I think he's played within himself. Uh, I think he's he's played um, the game that Coach Reich wants the team to set up to play. I think the coaching staff has set up great game plans. Uh, you know, we've, we've got to, that offensive line. The offensive line is the key to everything. We've got to keep those guys yeah. healthy. You know, yeah. we can't start losing – offensive lineman, that's going to break us down faster than anything. Then we'll get into having to throw the ball 40 times a game. But yeah. I would think any NFL team that can get away with winning games and only throwing it 28 times a game in this day and age um, is doing good. Yeah. That means you've got a strong running game. You've got a very strong offensive line. So I, I don't think he's faltered anywhere. I think he's tried not to showboat or do anything out of his realm of necessity right now. And that shows me great leadership in Brissett. And he's learning every game. And I think that he and Hilton will continue to hook up. Um, and, and like I said, he's got Rodgers and he's got uh, Paris Campbell. I mean, he's got speed. He's got outside speed. Yeah, you know, and no question about he's, it. He's got, and then you've got two reliable tight ends who just, you know, Jesus, most tight ends, if you dump over the middle, you get seven yards. You do that every play, you know, you're going to score every, every, every drive. You know, you don't need yeah. a big bomb play. They're nice to have open things up a little bit, but, you know, we got two great tight ends, and we got to keep yeah. them healthy. So this is a team right now that obviously, like every NFL team does, you got to keep players healthy. But I think the Colts definitely right now look like a playoff team. Of course, everything can change this week. Somebody can go down and anything like that. Uh, anything else on the yeah. offense before we take a look at the Atlanta game? Yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I think we pretty much hit – you know, every avenue I wanted to touch on. I, I just think, you know, like you said, they, they look like a playoff team right now. And without Andrew Luck, this is always going to be a very interesting year to see how the team looks. Uh, I think, again, like we've said a couple times, probably should be 2-0 and right now, you know, if, if Vinatieri can come through on a, a few of those kicks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the team looks good right now. Jacoby Brissett looks pretty good right now. Not a whole lot to complain about what they've shown you through. I mean, they've went on the road in the first two weeks against playoff caliber teams and split those 1-1, one and one, probably should be 2-0. and you know, not a whole lot to complain about there. Yeah, and we should we should be two and zero. I mean, and it's unfortunate. And like I said, yeah. it, hopefully that gets rectified this week, and Adam comes back with a strong game, and you know the confidence reemerges, and, and you know we get what we need out of him and what he can deliver for us. I mean, he, I hope he's just in a slump. Yeah. Um, you know, little timing off things like that. Okay, we're coming up now. We got Atlanta coming into town on Sunday. Watched them play against Philadelphia. Um, at times they looked inept as hell, and at times they looked like a, a playoff team. And they ended up looking like a playoff team in the end because they basically took it to Philadelphia. What are your thoughts on Atlanta? Yeah, so Atlanta's really, really interesting as a team. Um, they're an explosive offense, and they have some big, big playmakers on the outside. Julio Jones is going to be a nightmare. Julio. Yeah, yeah, Calvin Ridley on the outside just makes plays. Uh, Austin Hooper, receiver, is a good player. Mohamed Sanu is a good player. So they have a lot of explosive weapons on the outside. Now, the issue with Atlanta, and it's kind of plagued them through the first two weeks, is A, Matt Ryan with a lot of interceptions, five interceptions through the first two games, 
Um, you know, he's, asked, I mean, he's been asked to throw the football a ton. 43 passing attempts uh, against Philly last week. 46 week one against Minnesota. Uh, you know, yeah. they've really been a one-dimensional offense. They're a throwing football team. The running game has really never gotten off the ground. It's just been them throwing the ball through the air, play after play after play. Um, which can make them a predictable offense. And it makes me think of a guy like Malik Cooker, who the Colts have, you know, kind of a, a rangy free safety. It's going to be a big game for him because, you know, you know Matt Ryan's going to be taking shot, shots down the field to Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, Hooker over the top. So he's going to have a couple opportunities, I think, to, to get an interception. I think everyone knows that, you know, pretty – incredible play he made week one against Philip Rivers with that one-handed interception. So he'll get some more opportunities against Atlanta. Uh, he'll have an important role trying to, you know, limit the explosive plays to Julio and Calvin Ridley, but they they just have such a good receiving core, you're going to give up some big plays to them. Um, defensively, the you know, Atlanta's pretty weak as far as running defense. Colts definitely have the horses up front to take advantage of that. Uh, Minnesota absolutely dominated Atlanta on the ground week one. Um, Atlanta was really never in that game. I mean, they just were dominated from start to finish by that offensive line. Matt Ryan can never get in a rhythm because Minnesota is dominating that game from running the football, controlling the flow of that game. The Colts can do that again this week. They have just as dominant of a running attack as Minnesota does. Marlon Mack, obviously what he's done through the first two weeks is just – I mean, Atlanta's going to probably be losing a lot of sleep as far as their coaches – uh, watching the film on Quentin Nelson and what that offensive line has been doing up front. So definitely a weak point the Colts can exploit there offensively. And like and like we've mentioned, you know, the, the Atlanta defense doesn't necessarily look great, um, and you would like to see the, the Colts start to take advantage of some play action to set up some big-time Jacoby Brissett passes and, and start to you know get some more chunk plays in the passing game. But definitely you know, the two areas I'm watching – are going to be the Atlanta run defense. How well do the Colts run the football? Is this another game where the Colts can rack up close to 200 yards rushing? And that's going to be something they're very more than capable of doing. It's just going to depend, is Atlanta really going to cheat up against that run game or not? And two, how do the Colts deal with that explosive passing attack of Atlanta? I, I think you, if defensively you want to continue to make them be one-dimensional. Don't let the running game get going. Don't let them hurt you in both facets of the game offensively. Keep limiting them to one-dimensional offense and then take advantage of some of those bad throws by Matt Ryan when he's taking shots down the field, making those risky passes, start to get a few of those interceptions. He does have five touchdown passes through two weeks, but five interceptions as well. The Colts can take advantage of that, continue to you know, take advantage of those mistakes, you know, bat some balls down, you know, come up with a couple interceptions, get some key turnovers, and get pressure on Matt Ryan to kind of force some of those bad decisions. And if they do that, I think they can come away with the win. You know, I'm watching some video right now uh, from ESPN right now of the game. It's like, is this a team we want to blitz? Uh, because they throw the ball so yeah. much. Do we, want to keep, do we want to keep Ryan, get him out of the pocket and make him scramble every time? Because I'm watching the game right now. And when you get him out of the pocket, you let him sit in the pocket, he's going to pick you apart. Because Matt yeah. Ryan's a great quarterback. But if you get him out of the pocket, he throws sidearm. I'm watching it right now. He throws sidearm. Um, he throws off the wrong foot. Um, and it's kind of a wing and a prayer when he chucks it. Um, yeah. So is, is this a deal where the defense wants to think about throwing a lot of blitzes at him or, or you know, putting a lot of pressure on, on, the, on the passer? Yeah, no, I don't think there's any question about it. The Colts have been very good at, at rushing the passer through the first couple of weeks. Um, a big guy I'm looking at is Kamoko Ture. Missed the week against Tennessee, but week one against the Chargers, he was an absolute nightmare for them to block coming off the edge, had a strip sack. He came really, really close to a couple other sacks. Um, if they can get him back and healthy, and it sounds like he's going to be good to go for Atlanta in week three, that's a guy that can get, generate a lot of pressure, Justin Houston as well. Uh, definitely a guy you're going to want to try to get Matt Ryan feeling some pressure in the pocket. I mean, not just, you know, like you said, he, he has a tendency to when he feels pressure and he has those guys on the outside that are big play receivers, he kind of just, like you said, throws it up. It's a wing and a prayer, hoping let his receiver go make a play. Now, the good, right. the good facet of that for Atlanta is they have receivers that can make plays. They have guys that can take advantage of that. The bad facet of that is that's led to a lot of turnovers for Atlanta. <laughs> you know, the DBs are able to make plays. Yeah. From, yeah. 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 DBs are able to make plays on those balls. And I think what the Colts have is a guy in Malik Hooker who's probably one of the premier, you know, free safeties in the NFL. He, he's an absolute nightmare for 
you know, quarterbacks to, to play against. And, and really, I, I think he's probably a big area facet of when we talked about for the Colts, you know, through the year, through the first couple of weeks um, of limiting the explosive plays from opposing offenses. I think a big part of that's Malik Hooker because he's really kind of shut down the deep passing game for a lot mm-hmm. of these quarterbacks because they can't, they don't want to challenge him because he just has so much range back there. He can get to pretty much any side of the field. And so, you know, Matt Ryan's going to challenge him. You know, Matt Ryan is not going to shy away from taking some shots down the field, but get pressure on him, make him rush a few throws, make him just throw up some passes, hoping Julio can make a play. And I think Malik Cooker can have a big game. Like I said, I think he'll definitely get a couple opportunities to, you know, rip off a couple more interceptions. It's about if the Colts can take advantage of those situations. Like you said, you can't let Matt Ryan sit in the pocket and just pick you no, apart. No, you can't do you that. Wait, you wait for guys to come out of cuts wide open, get pressure on him, make him just throw it up, make him, you know, kind of hope and pray that Julio Jones makes a play. And when you do that, that's when Atlanta starts getting in trouble as far as, you know, the turnovers have gone through the first couple of weeks. Yeah, and that's why he's great because I'm looking at Atlanta stats. They only ran for 57 yards against Philadelphia. So, yeah. they're you know, and they threw the ball, what, you, know, you said, 40, 43 times, 310 yeah. yards. But, uh, you know, that's a one-dimensional offense, whereas I think the Colts have definitely right now have one of the best two-dimensional offenses in the game um, of any team. I mean, the Raiders or the Rams have a good two-dimensional offense too. You know, they're solid two-dimensional-wise. Um, yeah. Uh, with Gurley and, and with Goff and, and his receiving core out there, out here, um, and they look pretty good too. But, yeah, I, I to me, and I, I'm not a coach in the NFL, and I don't pretend to be one, um, but I, I seems to me they'd want to get as much pressure on Ryan and force him out of that pocket as quick as they can and get him to throw out bounds because he's not as accomplished to that as he is just sitting in, in the pocket and just throwing the ball with, with his feet planted because he's accurate and he's a damn good quarterback. Yeah, so, no question about it. Yeah, and then, you, then you've got Julio Jones back there who's like T.Y., or like Odell Beckham, he's, a, he's an elite receiver in the league. I mean, he'll burn you. If, if, if you miss a step, he's going to burn you. Yeah. And if you let Ryan sit in the pocket, he's going to find that burn. So critical for them. So anything else offensively or, or, or for the game against Atlanta? Anything else we need to talk about? No, I think we pretty much touched on everything. Um, you know, Atlanta's going to be explosive, but just keep them one-dimensional. Um, and, and I think as long as you do that and get pressure on the quarterback, there's going to be some opportunities to get some game-changing turnovers in this game. Um, and that, and if they can take advantage of that, I think the Colts will be sitting pretty in this one. I don't think Atlanta can stop the Colts' rushing attack, and I think they'll, that'll probably open up a lot of stuff in the play action. And I think the Colts can take advantage of that. And playing at home, your home opener, I, you know, I think you got to give the Colts the advantage in this one. But Atlanta's a good team, and like we said, they can put up a lot of board, a lot of points quickly. You know, if you're not right. playing good defense against these guys. So, you know, it's going to be a tough challenge. Um, I think I would give the Colts the edge in this one, but definitely going to be a, a very interesting game to watch. I'm trying to think. Have the Colts faced a Julio Jones type of receiver yet? Uh, through the, uh, well, you know, Keenan Allen's a, a great receiver, and they faced him week one. Um, you know, I, I don't think Tennessee really has a proven – Dominant receiver. I know A.J. Brown's a rookie, had a good game week one. But, you know, they have not faced a guy that's on Julio Jones level. I mean, he's truly an elite, elite level. You know, yeah. I may say that might be the number one receiver in the NFL. I mean, I'd have a tough time choosing another guy over Julio Jones, you know, if you gave me free reign to pick anyone. I think well, that I think, I think, you, do, I think you, you, you do that because he's got Matt, Matt Ryan sitting back there. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at Odell Beckham and um, Jarvis Landry, but I don't think – I think Mayfield's having a struggle a little bit here in the sophomore season. I think he's not quite got it cranked up yet. And Because I watched that game last night, and I'll tell you what, that was the most pathetic football games in Monday Night Football I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, it was like, yeah, they, who's going to lose this game, not who's going to win it. Yeah, they've got some issues so, to work out. Cleveland, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Baker Mayfield. Yeah, but yeah, but this, is our first chance, yeah, this is our first chance of going after – Having to be having to guard a elite receiver, and we'll see we'll see what they do. And I, I think the pressure is on the defensive line to get Ryan out of the pocket and make him check off and, and check down and throw the ball short and let our linebackers do their job. Yeah, 
you know, no question and, and about keep it. the pressure off our defensive backs because if you go man on man with Julio Jones, he's going to kill you nine out of ten times. Yeah, he's just no that good. I agree. Yeah, yeah. You got a prediction? Um, you know, I I think the uh, I think the Colts will run all over the Falcons. I, I I'd go Colts relying on a dominant running attack, take advantage of some play action, get some explosive plays in the pass game, and I'll go Colts win. I think twenty four sixteen. Yeah, I think it'll be a little closer than that. I, 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 I'm just not. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go twenty-four twenty-one. Twenty-four twenty-one. Yep. But uh, here's my second prediction. Vinatieri kicks three field goals in this game, and one of them's that puts us ahead and gives us those extra three points. <laughs> well, you know, I, I would, uh, I would love to see it. I mean, that <laughs> that's another guy. Nobody that wouldn't love to see it at yeah. this point. Is, he needs a good game. I mean, he needs to get that confidence back. But uh, yeah, it's like you said, you know, if he has another bad week, I, I think that's – he's done. I mean, you can't yeah, keep relying on someone at 46 me. if he keeps struggling. But so you're ho- hoping, you know, the, the Colts think he can get through it. So hopefully this is kind of a bounce back week for him. He can get that confidence back. Yeah, I agree too. All right, anything else we need to talk about with the Colts before we wrap this thing up? If you wanted to go yeah, 30 you know, minutes, we've been on an hour. <laughs> yeah, I knew we couldn't do it. I think we pretty much touched on everything. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. So, for the Grueling Truth Network and the Colts Weekly Show, uh, I'm Steve Risley, one of your co-hosts, along with our resident expert and co-host, uh, Cole Hanna. I want to thank you for listening. We'll come back next Tuesday with a Atlanta game post-game wrap-up and a Raiders preview. Uh, the mighty John Gruden is coming to town. Um, And guess what? We're not going to be playing on a baseball field. (laughs) So we we actually have a football stadium here. We're not going to play it. We're not going to play a victory field. We're going to play this in Lucas Oil, which will be air conditioned in 72 degrees. uh, Thank you for listening. Everybody have a good night. And Cole, thank you very much. And we'll uh, talk to everybody next Tuesday. This is uh, Colts Weekly Football on the Green Tree Network signing off.